Hello and welcome again for another Hardware.io webinar. My name is Antriksh and I'm part of the Hardware.io team. If you are someone who's interested in learning about car hacking or site channel attacks or hunting UEFI or similar topics, join us for our upcoming hands-on live hardware trainings scheduled next month. Our today's webinar is titled Syncing U-Boots with Depth Charge. Effective Exploitation of Boot Time Security Depth by John Simonak. John is a principal security consultant at NCC Group, who has tons of experience in security assessments with automotive ECUs, Android devices, and boot ROMs. He's going to talk to us today on how to cleverly abuse various aspects of U-Boot, including memory access primitives and exported data structures. For those who are new to our hardware.io webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom chat window. They would be answered after John finishes his presentation. So without any delay, let's welcome John to begin his presentation. Thank you. Let me just switch over to my screen here and then we will begin. All right. So uh, I'm really excited to share with you my work on this project Depth Charge, which has been it's kind of been my passion project for a number of months now. And um, although it's specific to U-Boot, this concept of security debts and technical debt um, is something that I encourage you to think about more generally at a higher level and try to think about how what I'm talking about here today you can apply to whatever area your personal expertise is in. Before we get started, I just want to address some terminology that I'll be using. First is technical debt. And the idea with technical debt is that if you're developing a product and uh, you integrate some external code, whether it be a proprietary and um, licensed software or it is some free and open source software that you just download online, there comes with some functional risk. Um, you immediately are kind of taking out a loan to get that functionality that you need. But if you don't invest back into kind of paying off that technical debt in terms of developing in-house expertise and knowledge about the code that you've integrated, then it could be the case that down the line, uh, changing customer requirements or bugs will cost you more because you didn't have that expertise. Security debt is kind of an analog to that. It's the same idea, but instead of functional risk, security debt will maybe allow vulnerabilities to creep into a product, perhaps just by direct adoption, or in a more subtle and nuanced way in which um, there's functionality that's operating as designed and as implemented, but your team has inadvertently included it into your product for which the context isn't really appropriate for that functionality. And that's where I see a lot of problems uh, in my work uh, with teams using U-Boot. Another term I'll be using is system on a chip. Um, I'm referring to the application specific processors uh, with integrated peripherals. Uh, you could take a look at the NXP IMX6 ULL is one example. Uh, you'll hear me say SOC or SOC sometimes. So uh, what is the U-Boot bootloader? Uh, it's, the full name is actually DOS U-Boot. And this is a code base that uh, it's near and dear to my heart because it's kind of a, a code base that I learned a lot of practical engineering using. And it's a very mature code and it's got an active community. So a lot of companies like to adopt it into their products. Furthermore, silicon vendors uh, are now using it in their board support packages to help engineering teams get to a kind of quicker time to market so that they can take a reference platform, work with the functional U-boot, and then kind of copy off that and uh, you know, bootstrap their platform. But that's a bit of a double-edged sword uh, because the kind of uh, ship it and forget it mentality can sometimes kick in. And uh, in the time crunch to get a platform up and running and get a product out, teams may forget to go back and kind of pay back some of their technical and security debts. And although secure boot is possible in U-Boot, it really requires the vendors and product development teams to invest time and effort into making sure their product is secure. So you heard me say, you know, security and boot 
Um, I just want to quickly address the, the notion of secure boot as it pertains to uh, SOC-based systems, which is a little bit different than what you might be familiar with, with like UEFI, for instance. The main idea is that um, we have a, a chip that has a, an immutable boot ROM and some key material, a public key often the time, oftentimes, uh, that's burned into fuses, so to speak, or is written into read-only memory. And when the processor turns on, uh, this serves as a trust anchor. We, we're executing in a known state. And the goal is that we want to have every piece of code that we execute and every piece of data we ingest to be uh, guaranteed to have not been tampered with by an, an attacker from power on all the way up to executing our application software. And this idea is what we often refer to as extending the hardware back through the trust. In the context of U-boot based systems, uh, many times you'll see actually two copies of U-boot being used. The first is the secondary program loader, the SPL, which is a tiny little build that can fit into a chip like the IMX6's internal SRAM, which will then in turn be used to bootstrap what's sometimes called the U-boot proper, which is a more featureful, uh, feature rich and, and you know, larger binary. And the area we'll be kind of focusing on with depth charge is this U-boot proper to Linux kernel handoff. And this is where I mostly see a lot of problems in terms of a lot of the feature rich functionality might not be appropriate for a specific product. And uh, that's not to say that problems happen elsewhere. They certainly do. Um, I encourage you to check out some, um, you know, on some devices, how the handoff between U-boot SPL and U-boot proper might break down where a team does not actually have the U-boot SPL authenticate the U-boot proper that it is fetching from NAND, NOR, or EMMC before actually executing it. That's another common mistake. So the key idea here is at every stage, we need to authenticate the code that we fetch from external storage and we load it into the you know, working memory, authenticate it in both data and code before we go to the next stage. The depth charge toolkit is focusing a lot on the UART console, is, which is pretty common for any of the, the kind of state-of-the-art work you'll see people doing with U-Boot. However, I want to just quickly address that uh, the attack surface of U-Boot is actually much bigger than uh, what a lot of people think about. So, like I said, depth charge does focus on the UART console interface and all these commands like memory display, memory modify, boot from memory, uh, CRC32, and then environment variable commands. But we also need to think about uh, physical attackers and some of these onboard peripheral interfaces. It's often the case that in a, a vendor custom driver, uh, tampering with traffic over a SPI or I squared C bus can uh, result in memory corruption issues. So. Um, getting on the bus and actually tampering is one way we can kind of break that chain of trust sometimes. There is some prior work, uh, I have a number of CVEs pertaining to um, network interfaces and NFS uh, remote code execution vulnerabilities. So network interfaces and callback to network uh, based boot is another area to be mindful of. And finally, just like we were talking about the uh, non-volatile storage, uh, we need to verify everything in non-volatile storage. If you're fetching something from an external interface, even you know more than once every time you need to authenticate it. So this idea of technical debt and security debt, and, and especially with U-Boot, um, where there's a lot of really rich functionality that's really helpful to engineers who are just trying to get a board booted and, and functional. You know, is something a vulnerability? Is it functionality? And ultimately, if you're on a product development team, your threat model decides. You need to think about what role your device is playing in the intended operating environment and the people that are using it, what are their security expectations, and uh, you know, what is the impact of, of a compromise and how does that affect the greater system. In industrial environments, uh, something like a LoRaWAN network uh, that's deployed in a remote location, physical attacks and hacking U-boot on a device um, you know, may be a realistic threat that you want to care about. It's generally the case of consumer products that you know most of us will have bigger problems in our life if someone's in our home than you know tampering with our gadgets. But uh, we shouldn't dismiss physical attacks on consumer products because there's actually a lot of scenarios that um, are often overlooked. Consider, for instance, uh, open box returns. So someone buys a device from a store, they take it home, they open it, they hack it, they put some malware in it, and then they return it back to the store, and it'll actually get put back on the shelf and sold to someone else. It's not really a scalable attack, but it is plausible. Uh, what's probably more concerning is when we have devices where our, our personal data is stored, maybe um, some credentials that we reuse even though we know we shouldn't, or um, you have credit card numbers stored on a device somehow. 
and that device fails and we need to return it for a warranty. Uh, in that process, we need to think about who has access to that data and who's going to uh, ensure that it's safely overwritten. I've actually seen devices sent back from RMA with other people's accounts on them. So all really important things you need to think about. So why did I develop the depth charge toolkit? Um, a, I keep seeing the same kinds of mistakes and patterns again. Um, and the common pain point again is this idea that there's perfectly good functionality that's fine for engineering, but it undermines security objectives when it's left enabled in um, a production build. And in the case where a vendor has gone to all the trouble of implementing and enabling secure boot flows, which is a non-trivial um, exercise many times, uh, this is really painful to have just a single command or something or a single operation undermine all that effort. Uh, so I wanted something that would help me demonstrate this to the clients that I work with and do so in a way that d does a, doesn't uh, prevent me from uh, not being able to get to the higher impact vulnerabilities, the more interesting ones that are perhaps in, you know, along remote attack surfaces, because those are the ones we really want to help them secure. Hacking U-Boot is usually just a means to an end. I wanted to take um, like 10 years of little tricks I picked up and from playing with being an engineer working on U-Boot and now a security person, um, you know, trying to, to break into it and put them into a framework where all my kind of ideas are in, in a, uh, can have consistent methodology and a presentation to other people to reduce the barrier of entry and have simple abstractions so we can say, I just want to read memory and write memory and have a tool to figure out which operations are available and which exploits I can kind of run. And I hope that uh, in watching this, you'll kind of be excited and, and maybe want to try to do some future work built the top depth charge. So finally, what is depth charge? Um, so it's the name depth charge, when I use it for my project, it refers to kind of an umbrella project, um, which includes first a Python 3 module that has a whole bunch of things including memory access abstractions built atop console commands, uh, both those that are specifically designed for memory access, like memory display, memory write, load B, um, load Z, load X, load Y, and other ones that are more interesting and subtle and can be abused to uh, perform arbitrary memory access operations, like the I squared C command, which I'll be showing here today, uh, the CRC32 command, which can actually be used as a write what where, um, and then some other things like set and um, excuse me, not set on set expression and other little commands. Uh, there's also a bunch of um, data structure identification uh, items I've added to help me analyze binaries so that I can more quickly find the thing I'm looking for in a binary that I dump from memory or flash so I can kind of get to the interesting parts of hacking the device. There's a bunch of utility scripts and examples that are all built atop of this API, so you can either use some readily made tools or build your own. There's also what I call the depth charge companion firmware. And the idea is that I have a tiny little device with some simple portable Arduino firmware that allows us to operate on the peripheral buses and kind of extend our vantage point beyond just that UART console and other, onto other places on the bus so that uh, we can kind of have more operations at our disposal. And then there's also this notion of U-Boot uh, standalone programs, which is really interesting and kind of neat. And I don't have time to talk about it too much here today. We'll um, refer to it a little bit, but I encourage you to check out the link that I've posted below uh, to kind of understand why this might be interesting. Basically, it gives us a really neat, easy way to write exploit payloads if we have a memory corruption vulnerability. So uh, the example we're gonna be going over um, in order to explain what depth charge is and how it works is a Sonos Symphonis device. It's a, it's a bookshelf speaker. And we're going to be looking at uh, this U-Boot version that they shipped with it. Um, it was based on the U-Boot 2016-11 build. And the vendor-specific kind of versioning is Royale Strict Rev 0.2, where Roy Royale is kind of like their board code name. And Rev 0.2 is the, the, their version of changes to U-Boot. And this platform is really cool because it's actually an example that I rarely see where a vendor has put some effort into trying to secure U-Boot. They've reduced their attack surface in the console. And it appears that they are using NXP's high assurance boot, the secure boot uh, facilities. And this example is particularly interesting because there's one command that kind of uh, allows the whole thing to crumble. Um, they've found this vulnerability before I even had a chance to you know, find and report it. Um, so that's really excellent. 
It, but the neat thing is that the devices still ship in the box with this uh, bootloader version and customers are forced to upgrade and get the security updates when they set up the device. So we can still kind of explore it and play with this at home, but most people are still protected by the fact that they um, have to upgrade the device in order to add it to their account. As I'm going through this and talking about you know, the specifics of depth charge and how to use it, um, don't worry about the individual commands and um, syntax, just focus more on the methodology. I've put together a bunch of documentation on depthcharge.readthedocs.io and you can read all the information there and that'll always be the place where I have the up-to-date technical information. So let's take a look at our target. Uh, this is the bookshelf speaker as uh, you can buy it in the store. Over here is where I've taken it apart. And on the right side here, we can see some of the things that we'll be talking about. This uh, arrow over here, excuse me, um, is, is the SOC, the IMX 6SX. And here's the full part number if you're curious. Over here, we have a UART connector, uh, which we can talk to that command console. And this is a non-populated connector, but the pads are still there. We can access it. Over here is, uh, I believe it's an I2C power monitor chip. And the pins on this device are essentially one way we can access the I2C bus. There may be other ways. This is just the one I happen to find. So step zero to all good U-boot hacking is looking for a UART console. Most devices expose this. Many of them don't attempt to protect it in any way. The Symphonis device at least uh, has some attempt to protect it. In the case of this device, it's kind of a small matter of just finding the RX and TX signals. Uh, once you do this a few times, it becomes second nature. Oftentimes there are headers or connectors that are either populated or just uh, laid out but not populated. There may be series resistors that you need to add uh, uh, that may be disconnected or jumpers you need, may need to change. It is not the case on the Sonos Symphonis device, but on other devices, you may find they set uh, what is called a boot delay setting. And this is something you definitely want to check in the U-boot documentation because there's different semantics for different values and they even changed over time. Uh, so check out the, the settings with respect to the value of zero, negative one, and negative two with respect to not allowing you to break into the console just by interrupting this auto boot setting. If you ever see that, uh, take a look at these two resources I've linked here. Um, you can often induce failures in the process when um, of loading a image from non volatile storage by just shorting a, a pin on like a NAND or flash device's address or data pins such that a CRC32 integ integ <laughs> integrity check uh, fails and the device will fail open to the console. So these kind of fault injection te techniques are a cool way to you know, get into a console. So we found that on the UR I showed you on that on the last slide. So now we're ready to do some initial device inspection. So what we want to do is just get a sense of the device and gather as much information as we can as quickly as we can. Usually I used to have um, a pile of text files where I just copy things and that kind of stinks and that's not a great way to keep notes when you're trying to work quickly. So I wrote depth charge inspect to gather this initial information and it really all it is is creating the depth charge handle uh, in the API and then saving off the current state of that. And that state information I put into what are called device configuration files which is just JSON and describes the the current platform, what commands it has, what version it is, what environment variables are available. And we can use what I call monitor functionality, which will display the underlying commands we're sending to the device, colored in green, and the responses back from the device in gray. We can then use a depth charge print uh, script to query the different information we've gathered on the basis of, you know, these are commands, environment variables, please expand the environment variables so I can read them more easily and a bunch more. And we'll revisit that in a little bit. So first what I want to show is a quick little demo of um, running depth charge inspect. So we're going to run the tool and uh, I specify the, the device configuration file and uh, that I want to use a terminal. I'll pause here and what we see, oh, excuse me, uh, what we see there is that we are spamming the hex value 03. We're trying to send control C and we're going to spam that until we get to the auto boot interrupted console. So I'll continue here and we see that happen. Uh, so we see the, the splash text basically, but it hasn't given us a console yet. And then at some point 
it'll break into the console and we see a whole bunch of the, the console text, the prompt a bunch of times. And what depth charge is trying to do is determine what is the text that is uh, always sent when I interrupt it. And it'll use that to infer, oh, that's, that's our console prompt, um, which you can override. And from there, it'll know, you know when we're back to a console, it can send commands again. The next thing it does is start gobbling up all the commands that are supported on the device. So it reads everything, and that's kind of how we can build our uh, sense of what operations we have available and what things can we exploit. And again, the, the Symphonix devices are really interesting because the command set is actually very limited. There's only, I think, 18 or 19 commands there. Uh, most of them are diagnostics that don't really seem to expose much, but there are a couple really interesting ones, like uh, this unlock command here. Um, I'll highlight it here. That was the update, sorry. Uh, the unlock command is one interesting one. So that kind of gives us a clue that, oh, maybe there's a way we can get more permissive functionality. And then of course, anytime you have update functionality, that's always an interesting thing to look at and assess the security of. Okay, so how are we going to dump uBoot for analysis? I already kind of mentioned um, I squared C earlier. And actually, if I go back quickly and just show you a couple other things in the, the rest of the video here. Um, once it finds the commands, it's going to print uh, some additional text. And what we see are some warnings at the bottom of the screen on the left side here. Uh, the device didn't find a BD info command. There's no register reader available and it can't inspect a global data structure. That's okay. It just means that there aren't enough operations for us to read you know, everything. So we can't do as deep of an inspection as I wanted. However, uh, what we can see is that there is an I2C memory reader warning that it says the depth charge companion device is required but not specified. And there's the same thing above for the I2C memory writer. This tells us that the I2C command is available, but we just need to connect the depth charge companion device uh, in order to um, you know, get uh, read and write functionality. So now we'll carry on and uh, let's talk about dumping U-boot from RAM so we can analyze it further. So as I mentioned before, we're going to use the I squared C command to try to dump U-boot from RAM. And uh, there's a whole bunch of other operations that depth charge supports. It's, you know, there's a subset built in, but it's intended that you can register more at runtime via the API in case you encounter one that I haven't implemented, um, or maybe it's specific to a custom vendor and you want to implement a different read-write primitive. And once we have the ability to read U-boot from RAM, we're going to try to identify any data or constants that might be interesting to tamper with, uh, code the hot patch, oftentimes like conditional surrounding authorization or authentication logic, or um, maybe some locations that we can deploy some executable payloads uh, and clobber some functionality that we don't need. Before we can do this with the I squared C based uh, read and write operations, we need to figure out which I squared C bus we uh, need to connect to. Uh, spoiler alert, it's number two. So there's a script in the depth charge code base in the examples called I2C probe that runs the existing I2C probe um, uh, command in the U-boot environment and tells us what devices are available in the bus. And typically what I do is I look at those addresses and I cross-reference them with the Adafruit I squared C list. And I say, okay, well, I know this address is often used for this device and that device has a public data sheet. I'll look at what kind of form factors the package is in and then visually scan the board to try to see where that part might be. That's not necessarily something you always have to do, but I find it helps. Once you find the device, you can then run that I squared C probe script and probe around with your oscilloscope and, and then see some active signals. And then you'll kind of know, okay, these are the two pins on a device that I need to connect to uh, in order to have the depth charge companion be able to operate on this bus. So how do we actually abuse this as a read primitive? So first, uh, we're gonna have our depth charge Python module, the host, and the companion are gonna be hooked together via a USB serial interface. The Python code to do a read is actually gonna send an I squared C write command to uBoot saying, hey, I want you to take the contents of your memory at this address and send it to the I2C device with this address and I want you to send this much. So uBoot will happily do that um, because that's you know, what it's designed to do and we'll send it to our device. 
So then we can then issue a command to from the Python code to the companion device that says, we want to get some data from the write buffer. Uh, please send it. The device sends it, send it back. And then we just rinse and repeat and do this whole process until we dump an entire desired memory range. And this is what this looks like um, in this particular setup. So what I have here is our, our UART interface over here, uh, hooked up with just a regular FT232 USB UART adapter. And then over here is the Teensy 3.6 running the depth charge companion for more. Um, I tried to make it portable as like a little library so that you can migrate it to other Arduino based platforms of your choosing. Or if you want to develop bare metal code, uh, I'd appreciate a pull request. Uh, I just wanted something easy for people to use. And then here in the center, you can see where we found the ITC bus again, as I mentioned earlier. So let's, uh, let's dump you boot. So we're connecting the uh, device up and I'll, you'll note here that there's a dash capital C argument. So we're telling it, hey, your companion device is located at this USB UART um, and we're gonna operate on ITC bus number two. We're going to request that we dump from this address ADFF27000 and we want one megabyte roughly, just a guess. And uh, the way I find that address is um, oftentimes by looking at the U-boot source code or the upstream code for a reference design platform that the product vendor probably worked with and used the same settings. And then I'll play around and look at the linker configs and figure out, all right, where is U-boot gonna be in RAM? Um, and then we'll uh, save uh, the firmware to file and let's see what this looks like in, in practice. Okay, so as I kind of mentioned, we're gonna be doing a bunch of I2C write operations. So essentially what you're gonna see in the monitor is that we're sending um, the I2C write command and the addresses are gonna be increasing and it's actually doing it 31, byte at a, 31 bytes at a time due to uh, buffer size limitation in the Arduino library and the fact that we need another byte for a sub address, but that works fine. So this is gonna keep going and this will actually run, you'll see uh, in the little um, progress bar for almost an hour. So it takes a lot of time. The I2C bus is slow and I wanted something that just kind of works and didn't really try to optimize it yet. Okay, so now we have the UBoot binary on our system and we're gonna analyze it because we wanna try to figure out you know, what, what's available to us. We already had the right primitive I mentioned, but uh, sometimes we can make our life easier by kind of working smarter uh, not harder, and we can find something interesting in the image. So the depth charge find command script uses one of the image analysis tools, um, what's called a command table hunter is the name of the class, and it looks for these data structures in U-Boot um, that are command tables. They call them linker lists, uh, not linked lists. It's actually uh, an ordered list of these uh, structures that the linker uh, orders and sorts. And this is going to actually tell us not only, oh, we found a, a command table, but it also try to infer the compiler time options that were used with respect to a couple of the options because the, the layout actually of the structure is going to change uh, with different compilation options. And what's really interesting and exciting on the Symphonics devices was we saw that unlock command and we we're like, okay, maybe there's some permissive functionality. We found two different command tables. The one on the left here you see has uh, 89 entries in it. And that probably means that that's gonna be our more permissive uh, environment. That's this one here located at this address. And then on the right uh, is our second command table, which only has 19 entries. And if you know, I were to scroll down through that, you could see, oh, these are the same ones we see in the environment we're in. Okay, so this means that we have a few options. So I already said we have I2C memory writer available to us. So do you wanna achieve arbitrary code execution? Uh, a good way to do that is oftentimes to deploy a payload somewhere and then just update the command uh, do command uh, is the name of the functions. Uh, update those function pointers in the command table to point to wherever you deployed your payload. It's a real, so then you can just run a command and execute. But in this case, uh, it seems like we have some custom authorization authentication logic. So uh, we can look to patch individual conditionals. The device checks like, oh, are we in an unlocked state? If so, we'll, you know, maybe do something more permissive and enable like diagnostic functionality for maybe uh, factory testing or uh, repair technicians. So we're gonna patch function pointers to both pre, auth, and post authentication resources. Um, so we're gonna look for these locked and unlocked command tables in binary. 
we're going to patch the is device unlock checks and execute the logic as if we were unlocked, but we're not actually unlocking the device. And in order to get a root shell, what we're going to do is uh, append uh, one of the kernel command line arguments um, with init equals bin sh, which is kind of the old, you know, classic trick of, of booting into kind of a, a fallback environment. And the reason why that works is um, although the device uses the Sonos boot command in order to programmatically build up the kernel command line arguments, they're not just available in a U-boot environment variable that you can change. Um, we enable uh, one argument that we don't need, and then we clobber it and overwrite it, and that's why we have an L terminator here, because I need to, to make sure we terminate that uh, command, or excuse me, the command line argument. Okay, so what do we want to patch? Uh, just here's a quick screenshot, uh, kind of in, in IDA. Um, there's essentially pointers to the locked command table and the unlocked command table. All we're really doing, we need to do here, is we're overwriting the locked command table and locked command, command table and the pointers uh, to point to the unlocked variant. And, and if you look at my example code, I actually do a few other things too. And those are really just to demonstrate that there's a whole bunch of other things you can do in patch. So uh, patching U-boot in RAM using the I2C as a write what where primitive. This is really the same idea as before, but just in reverse. So again, we have our uh, Python code talking to our companion device via USB serial interface. And we have a payload that we want to write. So in chunks, we're going to say, hey, please uh, buffer this uh, payload. And when you are asked for information, please respond with this. We then will issue the I2C read command um, to uBoot. And it will say, OK, I need to go out to this I2C device. Um, and I need to read some number of bytes. And I will take that result and write it into this address of the SOC's memory space. So then U-Boot will go happily do that. Um, our companion device will send back the response and uh, then copy into memory. So we've just deployed um, you know, an arbitrary payload somewhere we wanted because, again, this command is designed to help people developing with U-Boot. Um, someone who integrated this might not have thought, oh, this is, this is something that's actually exploitable because it's not you know, really necessarily that obvious. So just want to show the demo of going from uh, now we know where uBoot is running in RAM, and we want to patch uh, the running uBoot code to get the unlock command table. And again, we're not actually going to unlock the device. We're only going to patch the logic to behave as if it were. And that's really cool, because uh, we kind of keep the device in a golden state in some sense, and can more, more fully explore the platform and look for more higher impact security vulnerabilities. So uh, the Exploit script for this is in the examples directory of the project. Uh, we are going to run the Symphonis um, unlock bypass. And you see I just set the debug level, uh, log level in order to um, get more information. So we'll run this. It's going to do the device inspection because I didn't provide a config file. Um, and then the next thing, it, first thing it does is read uh, some of the contents of memory and just verify that the locations we are going to patch match the expected values. It then applies some of the patches to memory and then checks the command table and says, OK, we are unlocked. We have the bigger command set. We'll next go into Minicom and uh, take a look at the command table. Cool, we have all 89 commands now. And we have uh, memory display, memory write available. We can arbitrarily tamper with NAND contents. Um, and then this command here is not a standard one. Um, MDP uh, looks at a manufacturing data page. And I uh, just wanted to highlight again that you know, we didn't actually unlock the device. Um, the auth flags and software features flags are still set to zero. We just bypassed the logic in memory. So it's a tethered route. It's not persistent. So we use the Sonos boot command to launch the kernel. And there's our fallback shell. Um, the BusyBox environment doesn't have uh, ID or who am I, I believe. So I just kind of show a few files on the file system here um, to show you, that, yeah, this is actually a device. And then we run one of the scripts that loads drivers and you know, mounts file systems and things like that normally during the init process. So we see we have a JFFS, JFFS file system. I think it actually might be UBI. Um, if you enable Telnet D, uh, there's the banner you'll see. There's the version I'm currently on. And most importantly, I just wanted to show the contents of proc command line um, 
just to highlight again, the reason why we got the root shell is because we were able to just append that classic bin equals sh init parameter. So uh, before we finish up and move on to the QA, I just wanted to kind of revisit one thing very quickly. So uh, U-Boot's global data structure is something that I don't see people talking a lot about in the security world. And it's actually a really interesting um, feature or just fact of U-Boot. Um, I think it was originally created to facilitate the relocation from internal SRAM to DDR. And it's essentially a data structure that holds a bunch of information updated for, you know, like both pre and post relocation addresses of environments, stack and heap, uh, the jump table of exported functions, and a lot more. On ARM, the, a pointer to this is always stored in register R9. And on PowerPC, I believe it's R2. And uh, this whole jump table is essentially going back earlier to, to supporting these standalone programs and so that you can write a program and just load and have the addresses of some of your libc and kind of just standard functionality like spy transfer, malloc, free. So just to very quickly show you this, um, what it actually looks like. Uh, if I run the Symphonist Unlock Bypass program again with the inspect flag, it's going to run the exploit but then uh, additionally go do more inspection of the device again, just so we can see what more of uh, depth charges capabilities are. So we ran the exploit and now we're gonna delay a moment and then crash the device and then use a data abort to leak the R9 pointer. And we cause a data abort by performing an unaligned access on ARM, the ARM architecture, which is illegal. So at the very top there, you can see that um, here I do an MD, dot L of, uh, I do a long word read of that address one, this triggers a data abort, and, and then now in R9, there is uh, our pointer, and we'll continue and keep reading. So the data abort, this info leak, again, it's it's functionality that's working as intended, um, but you know, you'd have to patch that out if that's something that is dangerous to you, to you. and in often cases that is an info leak that you would do not want. Um, so what we just see here dumped to the console is when it actually went and read the global data structure and then found the jump table in the bottom half. And then we'll use depth charge print, which I mentioned at the beginning, to go look at all the information we collected. So I say print GD, and we now have, uh, here's our list of all the addresses of all the functions where we believe, them, they, where we believe that they are. And uh, we see some information about the board in terms of where the start address of the stack is and, and some other things. And then we can actually cross-reference that with the output of the BD info command. So that's kind of the power of depth charge print. It just gives you a nice way to view specific types of information. Oh, I apologize. Uh, give me one brief moment. <laughs> um, so at this point, we can skip ahead to uh, the QA. Um, what I'll do is I'll pull up a slide with some contact information and information about the project. Um, I'll turn things back over. Oh, actually, let me quit the cookie, sorry. Uh, so just key ideas. Um, so key idea, uh, technical debt can become exploitable security debt. So as a, as a developer, we need to invest in paying back these debts so that you know, it doesn't cost us more later. And, you know, so, so features don't become vulnerabilities. Depth charge allows us to explore and exploit these um, issues in U-Boot. And this toolkit is intended to expedite our workflow, not necessarily automate it. And it's a, really a tool for building tools for the operator. And again, for product development teams, less is always more. Uh, if you can reduce the attack surface in your U-Boot builds and remove things like the entire command line interface via the config command line compile time option, you can maybe just rule out entire classes of, of risk instead of playing whack-a-mole with individual commands. Some of the future work I'll be pursuing are configuration checkers. So to be more useful to development teams, think of things like CheckSec or the pay config harden checker. I want to do that with U-Boot uh, and, and try to warn that like, oh, hey, this, this you know, command you enabled can be used as an arbitrary write what where. Maybe you don't want that. Um, and I also want to do some other scripting to help me with source analysis and um, also you know, make it easier to automatically annotate U-Boot binaries in Ida and Ghidra. I would love it if people would well, want to contribute. Um, so on the next page, I'll have an email address. I need more visibility into what's out there in terms of the U-Boot configurations and what devices are doing what. I have a really cool write what where uh, CRC32 example, but I don't currently have a, a device in hand that I can uh, demonstrate that on. So if anyone comes across that device with CRC32, um, 
and secure boot, uh, please reach out and the GitHub issue tracker is where you can uh, you know, propose changes, ask questions, or submit some info about some cool platforms you found. All right, so I think we'll uh, move into QA and uh, here are some links for your enjoyment. Thank you, John. Uh, let me read out the first question to you, John. Uh, okay. What's the advantage of using I2C instead of using U-boot MD command over UART? Good question. So um, the trade-off here is that in the situation I was in, uh, in the, in the um, locked device state, this particular device did not expose the MD command so that I could dump memory. Um, I had to first find a way to um, expose that more permissive U-boot command environment before I could use the MD command. And actually, uh, when, we, when you saw it, the, the dump of um, memory when it was looking for the uh, global data table, that was actually using MD, uh, I believe. And I actually used MD to, to um, crash the device. So it's, there is a, MD would be a better option. It would be faster. But in specific cases, the MD command may not be available. So uh, the I2C command essentially is uh, kind of a, unlikely uh, uh, exploit primitive that a lot of people would overlook. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Let me know if it doesn't. All right. Uh, let me read the second question to you. Okay. Uh, in that sense, a secure boot is really just a static authentication of the image to be loaded, but doesn't provide runtime authenticity. I guess the security of a secure boot really depends on the threat model. I agree completely. And um, that's oftentimes, so in the area of kind of when you get from secure boots, you know, once if your bootloader and up to your kernel is secure, uh, you know, in terms of uh, extending your hardware back root of trust, the places where you can kind of fall short in the application space is, um, you know, sometimes people just don't authenticate anything on the file system. Um, you know, if they have ext2 or ubifs or jffs2, um, and it's possible that, you know, a tip, an attacker could take a chip off a board, you know, tamper with some files and put it back down. And they didn't even have to compromise that um, process. So some of the things, uh, if you go back in the recording later and look at that slide um, where I showed the secure boot process, um, a couple things that people can use are DM Verity. Uh, so that, that, uh, that's common in Android. So if you look that up, that's one approach where you can try to establish the authenticity of uh, contents of the file system. Other approaches are to use uh, like CRAMFS or um, an init RAMFS or some RAM based or um, you know a static image that you can boot and then authenticate that. And then you may then you still just have to deal with the problem of you know your, your read only file system where all your programs are is authenticated. But then you might have to deal with okay how are we going to authenticate user data? And so there's a lot of challenges and there's there's a lot to think about. All right. Uh I had a situation, I had a U-boot password. Any suggestion? U-boot password. Um, and actually, I believe the, so the, the product I talked about here today, I believe the latest version of Bootloader um, actually enables a password. Um, there are custom password protections that companies implement, and there are the ones uh, from the upstream U-boot code called U-boot stop underscore stir string. Um, so if you look at um, the auto boot readme in uBoot, you can find where this is. And there's a few different versions. If it's an actual password, um, sometimes the, like in the case of the auto, I think it's called um, auto boot encryption stir. And it's really a, it's a unsalted SHA-1 single round hash. So what you could do is if you're able to dump the chip off of one board, sometimes what you can do is go find that hash go crack it and then to try to you know, see if the same hash is used across all the products. And that's really bad because that's kind of a um, break once run everywhere kind of scenario. You really want uh, device unique authentication. Um, the other thing you could do is go back to the, I mentioned some fault injection attacks to try to get a device to fail open. You could try that. Um, you could also, if you have like a chip whisperer from new AE, you could try a glitching uh, system uh, and synchronizing it so that you send uh, a password, and then the moment uh, that the system is trying to authenticate it, you might be able to glitch and cause uh, an, an error in the instruction decode step of, of you know the architecture or something to you know have it 
incorrectly execute that conditional. So there's a few ideas there. I probably can come up with a bunch more. But I want to make sure we get to some more questions. Thanks. Uh, there is one more question, uh, John. Are you aware of any open source resources for secure RMA, manufacturer diagnostic unlock on embedded devices? That's a really good question. Um, I don't have an answer right now off the top of my head. Um, if you find out or you know, I would love to hear about it. I think there, uh, I think as we think about the whole product development life cycle and this concept of technical debt and security debt, I think uh, it would be really, really helpful and beneficial if we were able to get some kind of secure by default um, implementations for everything. I mean, there's a few, um, for example, OTA projects now that are aiming to you know, make it really easy to adopt secure over the air updates. But I don't think I've really seen one for uh, our MAPE processes, but in general, what I recommend is um, always um, ensuring that if you are going to have um, to support RMA functionality, always expose the minimum possible by defaults, don't expose anything, and then have strong device unique authentication. So you're gonna want to have maybe like uh, device unique keys, for instance, uh, so that you know, if someone hacks and cracks a password on one device, uh, it can't be used on another. Even better than passwords would be uh, you know, uh, asymmetric cryptography and devices having um, unique public private key pairs. And then you'd probably want to implement some sort of um, challenge response mechanism such that the station at a technician trying to do an RMA can say, hey, this is who I am. Um, I want to request to unlock you. The device can verify that. Um, and hopefully that station is actually um, passing this through to some system that audits the access logs. And then by doing kind of a cryptographic challenge response unlock mechanism, we could maybe unlock a device. And you might want to like set a fuse to denote that this has been unlocked before. So that might be something to think about um, when you get you know, refurb products. So, um, excuse me, refurbished products. Um, so yeah, I don't necessarily have like a open source RMA process in mind, but uh, this is the type of stuff we love to think about um, and the team I work with, and, and we definitely have ideas and would love to hear more from other people. All right, uh, John, we are out of time, but uh, I would like to ask you one last question. Uh, how much of security analysis can be automated with this tool? Uh, and how much of human intervention is required in your view? Um, yeah, I only kind of mentioned it very briefly because I wanted to get to the QA. Um, Right now, you know, I, I think as I showed you kind of like the, in, in this talk, the kind of example where you still need to have like a methodology and workflow that's operator driven. And it's really just kind of making individual tasks a little bit easier. Um, I do not expect that depth charge will ever be uh, something where you can just take a firmware image that you download from a product, throw it in and have a result. Um, I think, and that's mostly because that's not necessarily gonna help me um, and and I, what I want something to do is kind of like help me do individual little tasks more easily. So what I envision is I'll kind of build, keep building out an API to do these individual tasks, and then I'll leave it to people to figure out, you know, what is the most important thing to automate and what is the most valuable. Um, personally, um, if people want to do IDA and Ghidra plugins and stuff, I would love to see it. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that's where I'm going to necessarily take it, though. All right. Uh well, that's the end for today's webinar. Thank you so much, John. Uh, thank thank you. you so much, audience. Uh, please do check out that charge. And if you like uh, the presentation, please give a shout out to John uh, over social media uh, so that he comes back next time again with another uh, session or maybe a workshop. We'll see. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everybody.